So little do they know, I, I don't think I've actually worked out the bonuses yet. So <laughs> it's fine. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. My name is Paul Kinlan. It's, it's great to see you all here. I've had a really great two days, actually. Has everyone had a good two days? Yeah, cool. Um, everyone's been super awesome. I, I really like the conversations that are going on over lunch, uh, over, over the breaks as well. Like, there was a question before about kind of web serial and stuff I saw. Um, like, that's a big one that a lot of people are asking for, and it's kind of cool that you can go up to the Chrome engineers and actually pitch them for it. So I think that's pretty cool. But anyway, I'm here to talk about the, what comes next. Uh, I don't know how long it'll take. It'll be all right. I think we'll get out pretty soon. It should be pretty cool. Um, the, like, the thing I was going to say was that this part of the talk, and I need to stand before this, in fact. Uh, this part of the talk was, um, it was supposed to be just after Jake's talk. And Jake was supposed to talk about all the practical things, right? The things that we want to see from the future of the web in terms of like the infrastructural elements, you know, the improvements to the service worker, the improvements to the network stack with fetch and background sync, all these types of things. And then I get to talk about all the kind of the, the show busy things, right? Like web VR and all that type of stuff. So like this was me experimenting with it in like, I think 2009, 2010 or something. And it didn't work in the slightest, so I just, whatever. Uh, it, was kinda, it was kinda fun to play around it. I thought, I've got a gyroscope, I've got canvas, I'll be kinda cool. Nothing worked, I'm terrible. But anyway, one of the things I'd like to talk about, and I was trying to think about how we frame this talk, is that if you think about like back to two years ago, Alec Russell was talking about one of the, or a year ago, Alec Russell was talking about like distribution is the hardest problem in software, right? And the web for us is actually a great way of actually distributing our software because you just click on the link and go to the places. And if you've got any experience helping your grandparents or if you've ever worked in, like an in, like in a big enterprise, like you'll get these types of experiences where you have to go through and you have to go install the applications and you go and download them. And it's just such a nightmare. And like, who, who works in, has anyone worked in enterprise deployment at all? Couple of people. Like, it's an absolute nightmare. You build big pieces of software to deliver to enterprises, and then you have to go on site and have massive teams to go out and build all this infrastructure. And one of the things that I liked, and when I, I used to work for Experian years and years and years ago, we moved from this type of model into kind of the web type of model. And for us, that was great, right? We could just go to the user and sort of the, the customer and say, go to this URL and log in with your account details, and you'll get this experience. It was a really great model for everyone. But the interesting thing was, like, we knew at the time it was like way less capable. The browser, you know, although you had ActiveX and a bunch of other stuff, the browser didn't do a lot of the things that you'd expect a native application to do or a native experience at that point. But we traded that, traded that off. Like, we just said the model for delivering this software out to users and uh, all the like the enterprises and any user that's out there is like it's way better than the model that has existed in the past. And I tried to think about this model uh, of like distribution, right? So in the 1970s, you'd buy an Apple machine and you'd build it and have to construct it yourself and take it home. And then you'd have to program the software that was on it. And then later in the 80s, you could go to the store and buy the software there. And by the 90s, the web came in, right? And like, that's the start of the change, right? We, like, you could build web pages that were based on CGI at this point with a little bit of JavaScript occasionally. And then actually start to build interactive experiences where you know, immediately you got a lot of value from like, the web. I think that's quite powerful. But at the same time, like, native platforms are starting to catch up, right? Native platforms, especially at the time around, like, like specifically the iPhone came out, is that, you know, we, obviously we waited a little bit longer but, uh, for native applications to come through this. But like, at that point in time, we got to the bit where the web is great, everyone likes the distribution model of the web, we need to solve this for the platforms that we're shipping at the moment. And obviously things have changed, like app stores come along, and in the future, like chat applications and other kind of different social media, uh, or not social media, but like different types of experiences will enable people to distribute software more effectively. And I think, and I want the web to play a massive role and kind of make, uh, like be everywhere in all these platforms and be the key reason why you'd actually deploy on the, like deploy um, software, because the web is a great model. But the way I was trying to think about this again was the reason why a lot of people, uh, and at least when you speak to a lot of developers, why they moved to the native platforms and went with like native kind of, I'd say native hardware or native APIs, was, it's kind of weird, right? Like when the iPhone first launched, the web was the way that you delivered the software, right? Everyone said, like, this is the way you're gonna build applications. They introduced a whole bunch of new APIs that were media queries, uh, local storage, uh, web SQL, uh, app cache, you know, there's a whole bunch of different APIs that got launched to support the ability to deploy kind of comprehensive software on the web uh, through mobile devices. But then everyone was like, yeah, that's cool, but we want like these native APIs, we want this kind of ability to have a distribution platform. Like, and then that took off, and at the time, the web was just like, 
we'll catch up at some point and kind of like continued on for a long time without that much change, right? We thought we had all the primitives on the platform to be able to deliver a, compreh like a comprehensive and compelling experience, but like it wasn't until kind of, what, what did I, put? I guessed all these numbers, by the way, <laughs> about 2012. Like, so we didn't actually have, I think 2013 was when Chrome came to Android at this point, but we didn't have like a compellingly competitive mobile browser ecosystem at the time, and we weren't pushing out all the kind of the features that we, we needed. We knew we needed to solve payments, we knew we needed to solve all these other pieces, but we didn't really have the kind of the emphasis behind it to do it at the time. So I was thinking about like, what is the game plan for the web? And like, <sighs> right. so the whole thing about this is, have you ever seen a presentation by Paul Lewis where he draws like these most amazing pictures? He has custom slides for every single thing. Well, I was like, I'm going to do better than that. I'm better than Paul Lewis. So I bought an iPad and a pen, and that is all I could do. So anyway, the whole idea behind this was that I was thinking about like what is the mobile web game plan? And at the time, and like for the last three or four years, or maybe three years at least anyway, like it's kind of everyone's like incentive to say we just need to catch up with native, right? We need to have a whole bunch of these features where we know that natives are doing it. And it's obviously it's very hard to kind of get this all going with the specification groups and you know other browsers kind of collaborating. But you can start to see a trend, right? You can start to see more kind of involvement across the ecosystem to say, yeah, we well what's this one? We need to well, uh, geolocation JavaScript came through straight away, but you know, we didn't have access to the camera. So we've got get user media, we've got all these other different APIs coming through. We're not kind of completely compatible across the entire browser ecosystem on them at the moment, but we have the ability to try and solve those problems. And I think it's interesting that we are reaching more of kind of the native uh, parity at the moment, which is kind of cool. So, actually, I've lost the slide I was on. Sorry. So this is the kind of the graph that I've got. Is like, uh, like we've got all these new APIs coming in. I think it's quite compelling that you know we've started to see a massive change in the industry, but there is still a lot more to think about. Um, so we've got things like, obviously, like geolocation is one big one. We've recently moved that to the kind of HTTPS only. Uh, it annoyed a lot of people that we made that change, but we think it's the right thing to do for your uh, user security. Um, actually, we've got cameras, which is kind of cool. Uh, like the, the interesting thing about cameras, and I'll talk about cameras in a minute, is like we do have access to the ability to do inline camera access. We also have the ability to fall back as well. So if you have like a native camera application, like on iOS, you can choose to you choose that. Again, limited only to HTTPS. And this is a common theme across all the new APIs coming through to the platform, is that they have to be on HTTPS. We think they're powerful. We want you to use them, but they have to be secure. And uh, you know, users have to be able to trust, like, you know, trust, the, uh, trust them at that point. And again, an extension for the camera, the microphone. Again, same restrictions. You have to be on HTTPS. It has to be user-granted uh, user permission from there. Uh, we have the battery status. Again, this is a little bit contentious. It's been removed from some browsers at the moment. But the idea is you can understand whether, you know, people can access the hard. Like, people are actually trying to power the device, so you can maybe give a different experience. If the user is low on power, you can say, hey, we're not going to do all the kind of fancy animations. I don't think people are actually using that API this way at the moment. I don't think many people are using that API, but, like, that's what it's there for at the time. We have permissions on the platform, so you can actually build compelling experiences in terms of like, we know that you've got access to geolocation. I'm not going to try and prompt for geolocation straight away. So you can understand the state of the permission model that the user's accepted. Like, there's a lot more things to add into this, but you can start to provide more compelling experiences. And this is especially important when you're kind of building full screen applications as well. We have network information. A lot of developers, especially when we've been out to India, have asked, it's like, we want to understand the type of the network that the user is on so we can adapt the experience. I don't think we're actually using this to our full advantage at the moment. We've got things like a thing called Downlink Max, which basically says, hey, we know that the user is on a, at least a 2G connection, or at least you know, they can have the speed of the 2G connection. Uh, you, know, you might want to do something with it. And again, I don't think that many people are using it right now. But you can start to think about how you can adapt your user interface and your experience to the needs of the user based on the types of network that they're on. I think that's quite compelling. You know, we've got autofill. It's kind of boring. It's really hard to get people excited about autofill. But we know that it improves the overall experience of the web. Like, for users who are trying to fill in data, everyone hates keyboards, fill in forms. We really encourage people to use autofill. But no one really does. But like, that will change over time, I think. Um, because we know it has a measured and improved benefit for users at that point. Then obviously we saw the credential management API yesterday. I think that was actually really cool, right? Like you can get one tap sign in and have it synchronized across all your devices. That type of experience is a really great experience, especially when you're thinking about kind of cross-device, cross-form factor conversion at that point. And then obviously the payment request API. It'd be great to see whether this comes through and you know how it's kind of supported across multiple platforms. But my whole bit about this is that I really think, and I think Zach said this yesterday, is that you can start to think about amazingly compelling guest checkout flows. Once you know that the browser supports the credit card information or the payment kind of 
has the payment information that you can provide across platforms, or at least across the, across the device, then once you know that you potentially got that, you can start to think about, well, I don't actually need to sign the user in to be able to get them to make a payment. I can just take the payment and then ship them the, deep, uh, ship them the product after the back of that, which I think is powerful. Then obviously, push notifications. Everyone's been talking about push notifications for a little while now. We know that this actually has a material impact on people's kind of engagement and revenue and you know, re-interaction and everything. Uh, and it's great, on the, especially on mobile, it works when the browser's closed. You know, I'm not going to talk about this too much today, but like, this is one of those powerful APIs where we don't need to build a full-on progressive web application to actually start to take benefit or make a, a, like, receive the benefit of actually seeing this API or using this API at least. And obviously, we've got offline support, right? We've been talking about kind of building these offline-based experiences for a long time now. We, we've got the kind of the tools on the platform across most of the, uh, most of the platforms. And even if you, want to, if you want to fall back to AppCache, we don't encourage it. You can actually start to think about how you build these experiences. And it's not just about offline, full offline support. It's about kind of thinking about the resilience of your application in terms of like kind of an adverse network at that point. So I think it's pretty powerful. And finally, we get like this whole idea of installability. You get to the point where if you meet all the criteria, if we think your application should be installed or could be installed, then you know, you'll know you let the user say, hey, we can install this, and it will be on the user's device working like a kind of a native application would at that point. And we think that's pretty powerful. We think it's pretty good. But the thing is, I just, it's just a big list of APIs, right? Like We're just talking about these different kind of APIs, one after one after one. We know that the next API that we need to build is the most critical API that we need to solve. And I think that's the thing that I'm trying to say here is like, we did a whole bunch of APIs that we kind of thought were kind of cool to start off with, getting camera access, great. But it wasn't until the last maybe two years we've had to say, well, actually, we want to build these resilient applications that are like great in, this, in the face of adverse networks and actually get to the point where we need service workers. We need to make them installable. We need to know that users want to get re-engaged and through push notifications. It's been a lot more tactical about how we actually start to implement those APIs, which I think is a good thing, but it's, like kind of, it's hard to actually see that strategy kind of playing out. I, the thing that I want to get to this point, though, is like it could still get to the point of like everything is just a random API that we start to build. Like it could be that like I'm not pointing out the web serial API. We know that there's use cases for things like the web serial API, but we have to think tactically about how those how we bring those uh, APIs to the web because there are some really important things we need to get done. Um, and the thing is like we don't want every single API to be like hey native has got this. Uh, I'm actually going to talk about some of these ones, so I'm kind of uh, uh, contradicting myself a little bit. We know that like, the native platforms have got this. We're not going to implement this directly. We should think about how we want to kind of have them in the context of the web. And the context of the web is the thing that I'm kind of interested about. And we were thinking about it on the Chrome team a while, and they don't really like people using this, this acronym, at least, because it's an acronym. And like, if you've ever been to a Chrome Dev Summit, you get Rail, you get AMP, you get PWA. Like, the world is full of acronyms at the moment. But the reason why I like this uh, one is Slice is that it at least codifies some of the reasons why I think the web is important and the benefits of the web that other platforms don't necessarily have. Uh, so Slice is kind of simple, you know, secure. The idea is that we've got an overly restrictive permissions model and a security model where everything is sandboxed. You know, in the past, we've had some issues. But the idea behind this is you don't automatically get access to everything on the user's device. You know, you have to kind of do it kind of, if you want access to the camera, you have to ask the user for access to the camera, like those types of things. So it's secure. It's sandboxed. You can't just go and pull out data from another website that the user might have been to. Like, the whole kind of the web ecosystem is kind of conscious about security. And I think that's a very kind of cool thing for our side of things. Uh, the web is linkable. Uh, it's really hard to find a set of links over the last two days which haven't been well, interesting, I suppose. Um, but the idea behind it is like we have these links. Once we have the links, we can do really interesting things with them. Like we can build these types of sites, we can build indexes, we can build news like news.ycombinator.com. Because, because it's a link, we can go to it and we can do things with it. And then once you think about the things that you do with it, like indexability, right? That's the heart of Google for our point point of view, is like it's indexable. We can go and archive and organize and aggregate the world's information and provide. Actually, I don't know. Does anyone else know what the do you know what the our mission statement is, sorry, I'm pushing point to my boss here. No, cool. <laughs> that's the one. But like, that's the whole point, right? Is like, we can go out, discover the data. It's an easy, possible manner. Uh, sorry about that, by the way. <laughs> it's an easy, possible manner that we can start to understand, and then we can do interesting things because it was indexable and because it was linkable. And then the idea behind it is like the, the next bit is like, and we know this from kind of the whole start of the Ajax era, was it's composable. We can take, you know, take like JavaScript from somewhere, we can take an iframe. I know Paul didn't like the iframe thing before, but we can kind of start to mash together and build interesting applications just off the fact that 
other interesting applications and components exist on the web. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And then I think like the whole idea behind the ephemerality, this is um, the Guardian's mobile, they were out in one of the breakouts before, uh, the Go, uh, Guardian's mobile labs experiment of like it'll deliver you news uh, via notifications. You go in, you install it. Uh, you forget about the web page. You never have to go back to the web page to start experiencing these applications. Like, it, like normally the web lives and dies when the browser tab closes. Service worker changes that a little bit. But like these types of experiences we can build where we say like, I'm going to use it once. And in this case, I was using it. This wasn't for Brexit, but like it was on for Brexit. And we got to it. I fell asleep. I got all my notifications. And I saw kind of Brexit play out via notifications. Once I'd kind of cried a little bit and then um, <clears throat> like closed everything. It was closed. It was gone. And never received another notification again. And I think that's a very powerful model for the web is we don't have to think about these experiences where you have to go off, install it, and start to use it uh, just to get some experience out of it. Like it can live and die with kind of how you want it to. But the thing is, like, Slice is just a model, right? It's, it doesn't cover all the other benefits that we know of the web, right? It's accessible. It should be available for everyone to work on and use, irrespective of kind of like whether they can actually see it, whether they can hear the kind of the experiences from it, or even uh, actually interact with it. It's installable, like it's updatable, it's deployable, like it's composable. Like there's lots of even more. Though I've said composable once before, but like there's lots of different kind of properties that we know the web to be that actually just don't make this acronym make a lot of sense. Like, if you think about it, we've got this idea of like huge amounts of different properties. Like, like this is the thing, actually, I was speaking to one of the PMs the other day, like, we've got this massive ecosystem, right? And the thing I liked about the way he was phrasing this, like, it's a massive ecosystem. You can pull in from all these other tools from around the, around the web. Uh, you know, lots of other web developers are building on it. If one of those kind of industries goes away, it's fine, right? Because more people will kind of come back in. And likewise, there's no one owner for it as well. So you get to the point where, <coughs> excuse me, you get to the point where there's no one owner for the web. It means you're not behind a gatekeeper. You're not kind of controlled ultimately um, by their whims. At that point, we can go out, deploy it. And as long as you give the person the link, they can access that link. They can start to experience your experiences. And I think that's incredibly powerful. So for me, one of the things I was trying to think about is like, if it's not just about a feature race, what is it about? Well, we've done, been doing a lot of work. And I think over the last two days, we've seen some of it by Rick Byers and everyone as well, is we want to smooth out the platform. We do definitely want to reduce the feature gap. But we want to do it in a way that enables brand new styles of content and new, like, new levels of interaction that we're never going to see from any other platform uh, unless it's the web. So one of the things I was thinking about the smoothing out of the platform, this is the second image I drew with uh, the iPad. Um, I was actually quite proud of it. Everyone else hates it. But the idea is like you have this uh, like kind of level of lumpiness, right? Like the web is not even. Not every single browser implements every single feature. And as web developers, we quite frequently find that really, really frustrating. But the interesting thing for us is like there are really big things. And some of these big things I'm going to talk about today, like things like Bluetooth or ES6, like you know that it's not there, but you can kind of see it, right? So you can kind of ignore it and go around it and say, when that becomes ubiquitous, I'm going to start to use it. But then there's like the really frustrating things, like things like Flexbox, where there was two different implementations of Flexbox. And it's really hard to work out which individual browser supported which individual version of Flexbox and which syntax. Like those types of frustrations really kind of, well, they frustrate developers. It means that you can't build great experiences for your users that are responsive and accessible for everyone. So one of the things that we've been trying to do is like smooth out some of those rough edges. And then the first one, and it's one of the most recent, is like position sticky is like one of the ones that developers have always wanted, right? They've wanted the ability to say anchor an element to the top of the viewport. And we had it in Chrome, and everyone was like, that is great, right? Apple have got it, Chrome's got it. I think Firefox had it at the time. And then we were like, yeah, it doesn't, it's not that performant, so we're gonna remove it. By removing it at that point, I mean it might have been the right thing to do ultimately. Uh, you know, we got to the point where it wasn't compatible, right? So people couldn't use it. You couldn't rely on it. So you couldn't build the types of experiences that, you know, it, like this is not a great experience of where you might want to use it, but you couldn't do it without JavaScript at that point. You either have to include it or not include it. And for developers, that is actually a really frustrating part of the experience for them. And then we get this idea of things like uh, Intersection Observer, right? We know that the web is slow when you scroll and you're trying to kind of keep something in the view or know when something has gone into the view. Now, this isn't necessarily about bringing like, ubiquity to the platform, because I think Chrome is the only one that implements uh, intersection, ob intersection Observer at the moment. But the idea behind Intersection Observer is like we want to kind of provide a level playing field for performance as well. So you can start to understand when elements come into the viewport and when they leave the viewport, so that then you can do your kind of uh, your room or you know, whatever you want to do with your, whether it's ads or whether it's some other types of logic as well. Which I think is really cool, because then when you start to think about the next part of the future, and like this is one of those ones where 
like, this is really hard to actually see in terms of the code, and there's not a lot of detail in this. I, I stole this from Paul Lewis's uh, uh, Polymer talk, which is actually was a really good Polymer Summit talk, which is a really good talk. Um, but the idea behind it is, like, custom elements for a long time have been kind of talked about. They've been deployed in some browsers. We didn't deploy it completely because we had a v0 and now a v1. I think now, now is the point on the web where like, developers have been really frustrated that they couldn't do these types of experiences. It was completely I suppose, uneven is the easiest way of saying it uh, at the moment. Uh, and it's great to see that you know, this has come to a lot more browsers at the moment. It's definitely in uh, Chrome. The latest versions of Safari uh, definitely had uh, template syntax. Uh, and now they've got custom elements as well in the Shadow DOM. So like, that whole part of the ecosystem is all starting to play out. And it's great to see that a lot of the browser vendors are all starting to work together on. We know that these are the important APIs that need to get done. Developers have been saying that we need to get these APIs completed. And finally, we're starting to kind of get a rounder picture. And on that subject is another one is like, we, as on the Chrome team, we made this decision to not support pointer events. And I think about two or three years ago, we had said, we don't want to introduce multiple pointer models and multiple interaction models uh, to the web. We don't think developers want it. Uh, Microsoft is like, yeah, no, developers do want it. You know, we've got this experience. They want to have one unified model of interaction, interacting with things like touch or interacting with things like the mouse pointer. They don't want to have to deal with all the different ways of doing it. And so developers shouted a lot. And Rick Byers, who was on yesterday, was one of the engineers who started to kind of implement that and flesh that out. And now pointer events is in Chrome. So we're trying to start to bring more compatibility to the web to like level out that part of the playing field. So it, for you as a developer, it makes it 10 times easier to work out whether you, what you should support and how you should support it. So I think that's pretty interesting. And then also, like Darren mentioned this in the keynote yesterday, uh, is that like, we, we've been pushing progressive web apps for a long, long time, right? And we've been saying, well, say about the last year and a half, maybe a year. Now, the whole idea behind it is we want your applications, if you want them to, and the user wants them to, to act and feel like a native-like experience. Like, if it's, if it's installed on the device, it should appear everywhere. And if you've actually ever installed one of these, like, yes, you can get it on the home screen, you can launch it, and it's in the tab switcher. But that's when the kind of the illusion breaks down after that, right? Like we've got a nice model, but it's a massive uncanny valley at the point of like these aren't actually native applications on the system. They don't li like live in the app view. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other kind of edge cases that every single developer who's implemented a progressive web app, either with push notifications or not, has been complaining about. So what Darren was saying is like we actually want these experiences to look and feel like they're native. And so this is the flow that we've got, I think. Um, Excuse me. This is the add to home screen flow normally, or not the add to home screen flow normally. This is the, the new kind of install flow. So we've taken the whole idea of add to home screen, which essentially was a bookmark on the home screen with a special parameter that Chrome knew how to launch the screen into a fully kind of native model. So the application is downloaded, installed. Uh, it's still a progressive web application at the time. Pulled, everything's pulled from the web. It's not anything kind of packaged up and everything. But it's a native application on the user's system at that point. And I think that is incredibly powerful. Now, you can experiment with this today, and I'll show, show you uh, how to do it in a minute. But the idea behind it is like we want to experiment with this. It's a flow that we think is going to work, but we do need a lot more feedback. But once you actually get these applications installed, it's really good. So one of the kind of things that we've seen is that we've got the like developers wanted, or users at least as well, wanted their applications to appear in the app drawer and other elements of the system UI as well. So it now appears in the app drawer. You can actually go and inspect um, like the like the storage model of it as well. So you can see the storage. Storage will be allocated to the application, not just the Chrome or the webs, like the like Chrome as a whole. And then you can do a bunch of other stuff as well. So you can force install, uh, force stop it, uninstall it. You know, you get access to the like the battery profile and a bunch of other stuff. So your application is ultimately accountable versus just being accountable to the browser at that point. Uh, we also get deep integration with links. So if you own, like in this case, airhorner.com, and the user clicks on the link to airhorner.com, rather than going to the website, it will go directly into your native application at that point, or your progressive installed web application at that point. And I think that's pretty cool, because all you have to do is update the manifest uh, to actually say how it should actually be intercepted on the user's system. And likewise for notifications, like you click on a notification, like the bugs that we had on the system were like you click on the notification, and it would go to the actual web app versus the thing that was installed on the home screen, which essentially are the same thing. We just didn't know, and we couldn't launch the application uh, at all because we didn't know it was installed on the home screen at that point. So we kind of leveled out that part of the playing field, so it's a lot more compelling and a lot more natively integrated at that point. Hey, thank you. <laughs> 
The other thing as well is we do continue to uh, respect the launch information as well. And the interesting thing about the launch information is that obviously when you click on the home screen or you click on the link or you click on the notification, you do want it to launch in portrait or like if it's a game, you might want to launch in landscape, those types of, like that type of thing. We've, been, we've had a lot of trouble actually making sure that was synchronized across the entire device. The cool thing for me, at least anyway, is that the biggest thing is that we can keep the application name and launch profile in the manifest, everything, all that information up to date as well. So the good thing is, like, if you update your manifest right now, because it's just a bookmark, we don't know whether your application is updated, we don't know whether you've changed your name or the icons changed a little bit, those types of things. We now have the ability to actually say, we know it's changed, we know that the user's got it installed, and we can update it across the device as well, which I think is actually pretty powerful. And the great thing is, like, if you're already building a native or a progressive native web application, that's not the word to say, is it? If you're building a progressive web application, like, you don't really have to do anything. You have an optional scope attribute, and that's pretty much it. The scope attribute just says, this is the URL string that if the user clicks on it, uh, will be open, will, will cause my native app, or my web, I keep saying native application, my progressive web app to open up. Um, I think that's really cool. So it's experimental today. Uh, if you just go to Chrome Flags and search for enable improved add to home screen, uh, you'll be able to get it, and you know it's it's actually really interesting. But the thing I would say is, we do want a lot of feedback around this because we want to make sure that the model works for users, works for developers, and we can go more from there. But I did say that was kind of smoothing out the platform. I think a lot of the things that we've been talking about is just making developers' lives a little bit easier. I do want to talk briefly about kind of de decreasing the feature gap because this is where, for me, some of the show busy things come in. Um, but the interesting thing about the like this is that we we're in this weird tension where. There's a lot of new APIs come into the platform. Some of them are not completely specified at that point. Like in the past, you go through Chrome flags and you enable it to test the API. Um, but that's actually really hard for doing kind of, in this case, Alex Russell was saying, doing science on the web at scale. Like if you want to know that an API works with all your user base and how it works and how users interact with it, you somehow have to get that out onto a stable channel somewhere. But if it gets out onto the stable channel, and then developers start finding it, like the old, kind of say, WebKit prefixes, but the old prefix model, like that causes a lot of problems in the long term for developers. And we don't want that to kind of happen. We want to be responsible about how new features and new APIs are designed, but tested at scale. So I definitely encourage everyone to look at uh, uh, Alex Russell's post on this, because it gives a lot of insight about how we're thinking about this model. But the, the name, and Alex alluded to this in the panel session, is Origin Trials. Now, the idea behind origin trials is that we sit there and go, well, we think that this API is going to be important. Like in the case of web Bluetooth or web USB or uh, persistent storage that Drew worked on, we know that this is like an important piece like, of the overall kind of API ecosystem. It's not fully spec uh, specified just yet, but we want to get it tested out. You have to sign up for the API. There's, there's basically uh, a link that you can go to on any of these pages. You sign up for the API. You drop it inside your web page. In this case, it's a meta tag. And then the, the whole thing is designed to kind of, I don't want to say fail, but it's kind of, it's designed to only run for a certain amount of time. So this is like, as a developer, you know that you're opting into this experience. You know that at some point the API will change. It might change significantly. It might actually get pulled out once we know that we don't actually want to ship, or developers and users don't want this to see this shipped on the web. Um, but the point is that these origin trials uh, allow you to have that flexibility to experiment with the API, give us a lot of feedback, and then we can actually help, kind of help the specification process move along a little bit more effectively. And one API that I want to talk about that is behind an origin trial, and it's quite close to my heart, is the web sharing API. Like, I, I used to work on the Web Intense API, and the whole idea behind that model was to say the user should be in control of the applications that they use to perform common tasks. So if you want to edit an image, you would use the image editing application that was on your site or inside your native application or inside your device at that moment. The problem with it was it was too broad. We learned a lot about building ecosystems and building APIs where you know, it's an undefined scope, an undefined kind of range about how big this should be. We got a lot of feedback from developers that are like, well, I don't want to edit and I don't want to save. I'll do an edit and save intent at the same time. Like, it got to a point where we couldn't feasibly deploy this API at scale. So what the thing was, we said we should go back to the drawing board and design smaller chunks. Right? We should try and solve the sharing intent. We should try and solve the different kind of aspects of uh, what we were trying to, like the original vision was going to do, but do it in an isolated sense. So this is the sharing to App or this is sorry, this is the web share API at the moment. It's an origin trial inside Chrome. You have to subscribe up to it. We're testing it out. We want a lot of feedback around this, but it's a simple API. Cool. It's all right, isn't it? Uh, it works pretty well. But the idea behind it is you just share some data, and then that will be passed to the underlying kind of sharing information. Like in the case of Android, it will just do a um, 
Farah basically a send intent, and then the application picker will pick up, and then you'll be able to share the data to it. Like, it's got some problems still. We need to flesh out images and a bunch of other things, but the capability is there. We've got the ability to test this on sites with every single user who, say, visits my rather low traction blog at the moment. Um, but I think it's a powerful API. But that's going from web to native, right? And what we're saying is we want the web to be across all that, like the, the user's ecosystem. So in this case, we want the, and this isn't actually ready yet, and we're still trying to work this out, but like the web target API. The idea is that your web application should appear in the native picker. Now, we're trying to do this via the web app manifest and then also the service worker as well. But like, this is one of those things where the, the intent is clear, right? We want to make sure web applications, if the user installs them, act as first class citizens on the web. I think it's pretty powerful. There's also a whole bunch of media improvements as well. And this is where things get kind of a little bit more interesting, at least. The whole media team have been working on this idea of, you know, developers don't have to do everything. Like, we can provide a lot of integrated experiences with the, like, with the user's device. So the first thing that we did, and this was about a year ago, was anything that you did, if you had, like, a connected, who's got an Android Wear device? Oh, that's more than I thought, actually. It's cool, cool. <laughs> so if you're play, if you're play. <laughs> Normally, normally, no one puts their hands up. But if you're, play, <laughs> um, if you're playing some media, you'll be able to kind of, that notification will get generated on the user's device, passed across to your, uh, to your watch, and then you control it from there. The developer doesn't have to do anything, and that's actually pretty cool. You get this kind of thing for free. Again, kind of just making the platform a little bit richer for web developers. We've also got the ability to do things like background play. So you can take, um, you can take a, like a movie file or an audio file, Close, the, like, close it down or close your, turn your phone off to go to the home screen to go dark. And then you can just like, still control the web experience. I think that's actually quite powerful. Like, you can start to think about podcast applications and music applications, which you can just run like, in the background continuously still, but have the ability to control them from the web and from the user's device. And then if you move a little bit further on, some of the rest of the work that the media team are doing, and this is one of my favorites. I, I did a little uh, a demo later on, which I, I think I quite liked. But anyway, the idea is like capture stream, right? You want to record something from a canvas and actually record it into a movie file, right? Like a lot of people have been doing this to try and generate um, like animated GIFs and a bunch of other stuff in movies. Like there is a dedicated API now, uh, canvas.captureStream. It's, it's in behind Chrome flags at the moment. Uh, I, actually, no, it's, on, it, it's, in, it's in Canary normal. Anyway, you basically get the canvas. You say, I want to capture it at 25 frames a second. And in this case, I'm just going to attach it to a video element. It's probably not the best use case to do anything with that video element. But it's a stream. You can put it onto something that can read streams. And once you can put it onto something that read streams, is you can do things like, well, I'm going to put it on a WebRTC connection, and I'm going to send it out to someone you know, in Australia, and we're going to kind of, they're going to be able to see what I'm doing on the screen, like inside my kind of WebGL 3D uh, game, which I think is pretty powerful, right? Like, it's very hard to do these types of experiences uh, like on any other platform. On the web, now it's three or four lines of code, and you can start to stream your experiences with your kind of friends and family. And one of the things I do like is that you can then think about, well, I've got the stream. I actually want to record it and actually kind of save it and persist it to disk. So this is using the Media Recorder API, which takes the stream from the camera at this point. And then when the data kind of comes through, you append it to a blob, and then you just start recording. And then once it's completed, you get the blob. And in this case, this is the demo that I wrote. It's a little bookmark that I wrote. It finds the canvas on the page, download, uh, records it, stops after 10 seconds, and then downloads it as a WebM file to your hard drive at that point. Like, it's 20 lines of code, and you can get this experience where I've not actually seen this type of thing on the web before. Record a WebGL game, kind of throw it up to YouTube, and it's pretty cool and pretty powerful, I think, at that point. Um, but once you kind of have the camera, like the, the camera, and this is the thing that most people don't know, is like you, you have the streams coming in, you've got WebRTC, you can send a video stream, now you can send a canvas directly to the user. Uh, one thing that everyone says is like, we can do a lot with the kind of the user's camera right now. We've got get user media, which gets that stream from the camera. That's like a camera app. But we only found this out maybe about six months ago. If you actually capture a frame from the get user media API, it's only like a 1080p. It's not like a raw full dump of the entire kind of camera frame at that point. Now, the thing is, we've got the um, image capture API. Uh, it, again, it's in Canary at the moment. But the idea is you can pull in a get user media stream, say, I want to take a photo, and it will give you the photo, like the blob of the photo at that point. So if you've got a 21 megapixel camera, in theory, you'll get a 21 megapixel image, which I think is pretty powerful. The more important thing is that you actually get to understand the settings and the capabilities of the camera. We haven't had this before, right? We can take the media stream and say, what can, I, what can this camera do? Well, it can zoom in. Uh, you can control the ISO. You can autofocus. You can do all these other things with it. We now get that piece of information. Uh, you know, we can get that back. And once you can get that information, the next thing to do is 
Can I do something with it? Well, the answer is yes, roughly. And it's like the idea behind this is you, if you know that the range for zoom is that you can say, well, I want to do a double zoom. And the idea here is that you, know, you will obviously do the zoom. And this is the video, at least anyway, where I was trying to record the slides, and it didn't quite work. But the idea is you have the camera, you change the properties, and it updates in real time. And then when you take your photo, it will use those properties as well uh, again. I think that's pretty powerful. We can build kind of full-on camera applications. Not that we need to, but we can help build full-on camera applications on the web. And I think that's pretty powerful. And then one of the other ones, and this, is, this came in last night. So this is one of those ones where I was speaking to one of the engineers on this, uh, Miguel. And he was like, Paul, I've got this API for you. Can you talk about it tomorrow? And I said, what's the API? Because uh, I'm going to run over time, and I've run way over time now already. Um, he said, I can detect faces. I've got an object detection API. In the future, it'll do QR codes. It'll do barcodes. Right now, it does faces. I was like, nah, that's not true. And he showed me, like, this is the code, right? You basically do face detector. You detect the faces with the image that you've just captured from the uh, image capture API. And then you can start, you can pass it to the underlying kind of system behind the scenes. And then it will find the faces and you get the information that comes off the back. And I think that's actually pretty powerful, right? It's like I built a QR code scanner um, a couple of years ago. And to get it running at 60 frames a second, it's an absolute nightmare to do. And if I have one API that lets me do that, like that is actually a really great thing for me at that point. So that kind of brings me on to the next bit. It's like we have this idea of sensors behind the scenes in terms of like face, face detector sensor is not really a sensor, but it's a thing that uh, is there that pulls out data from the underlying device. Now, the generic sensor API is an interesting one because the idea behind the generic sensor API, it basically provides a common, I need to get this right, but like a common abstraction for how to access hardware uh, consistently inside the browser so that the browser vendors have a way of saying, We've got all these different APIs. We've got like a gyroscope. We've got an accelerometer. We've got all these different ones. Like, how do I kind of access them consistently in a relatively sane and uh, like equal way across all the the different sensors? Um, this has been kind of in you know in edit mode for about a year and I think about a year and a half. Uh, it's only recently that we've started to actually put this inside the browser, and it's on. There we go. Uh, this is the, I'm really proud of that demo because I was like, that's going to annoy so many people. But the idea behind it is you can have a sensor that is like, well, the ambient light sensor in this case. It landed in Chrome, uh, in Canary uh, the other day. And the idea behind it is it just reads the light values from the image sensor or it, whatever kind of sensor that you've got, uh, which can actually detect light levels at that point. Uh, you initiate the ambient light, or you, st you get a hold of the ambient light sensor. Uh, you put a handler on it for on change. And then you start it, and then it will deliver changes at maybe a specified frequency if you want, you know, regularly to your on-change handler. You just put your application logic in there, and you can kind of do whatever you want. The interesting thing about this API is that you can also poll as well. So if you don't want to have like an on-change handler always firing, but you only want to do it kind of synchronized to a frame, you can actually say, well, what is the data from this sensor, or what is the value of this sensor, and it will return the last, last value. And I think that's quite interesting. Ambient light, I don't know how much use there is. You might put a dark mode inside your application, or you might do something super annoying. Um, but it gets a little bit more interesting when you think about like a compass, right? A compass uh, needs actually, I didn't realize this, I just thought it was like the alpha component of the orientation. Uh, it actually needs multiple sensors to be able to build a compelling compass uh, for the web. And uh, uh, Kenneth from Intel gave me this demo, uh, which I'm grateful, I think he's up there. There he is, hello. Uh, <laughs> um, but the idea behind it is there's multiple sensors. You need the accelerometer and the gyroscope uh, to actually start to think about like, how you can actually kind of get the proper compass values. And at this point, like, it's quite simple. You start both the sensors up, and then you kind of get the changes, and then you kind of um, you, know, you sort the store the changes in some global state, and then you update when you uh, when you need to uh, render at that point. And it's just quite simple. The logic behind this is quite like it was harder than I thought. It was using quartonians and a whole bunch of other stuff, but like. That whole point is like you've got two or three sensors on the device. You can start to do really interesting and compelling things with them once you start to get that data through. And not necessarily have to rely on a browser vendor making the Compass API at that point just to actually solve those problems. And I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, actually, did I just talk about the wrong slide? Cool. I didn't play the video. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so. Um, the, that's kind of like the newer APIs coming through. I think some of them are pretty cool. Like some of them are very hardware driven at that point. And the one thing I do want to try and get across, at least, is that I, I want these web APIs to kind of, I, I say mimic native. That's the wrong way of saying it. I want all the capabilities of the native platforms to be, be available to web developers. But I don't want us to kind of like lose our soul at the point of saying that we must have an exact parity with those APIs. There are very webby things that we can do that no other platform can do. 
And like, that's one of the things I think is pretty cool, especially on the whole ephemeral aspect, right? Is like for very short, lightweight experiences, uh, you know, whether it might be a marketing campaign that a lot of people get asked to build, or just even things like the election users, like you don't want to have to build a native application, deploy it through the stores. You just want someone to go to a URL and start interacting with the experience, and then when something happens, be able to respond to it. I think that's a very powerful thing to do. And I think if you look at things like uh, the physical web, has anyone interacted with any of the physical web beacons uh, today? That's cool, quite a few people. Like we had Polymon kind of on there. The physical web broadcasts the URL, your phone picks it up or any device that can actually pick up the, the kind of the, the beacon signature at that point. It understands what the URL is being broadcast, present you with some metadata in the user interface and then you can st click on it and start to interact with that experience. That's super lightweight, like no one's ever gonna build or install an application which is just there to interact with the TV just say, say for a conference and those types of things. Like the lightweight kind of em like ephemeral nature of these experiences, especially through physical web, are really powerful. But the really interesting thing for me is like, yes, we can discover a, like a beacon which is kind of cool that points to a web experience, but actually sometimes we wanna take the, the web experience, like the, like the URL that's being presented and it's actually to a physical device, right? Like whether it's, I know we were talking about Internet of Things before. But like this is where yeah, you can start to see the kind of the tie-in with Web Bluetooth. And Web Bluetooth, again, we, we talked about this last year, but it's at this point now again where it's an origin trial. I think it's an origin trial. Is it still an origin trial? Yeah, yeah it's still an origin trial, man. I thought we'd so it's an origin trial, so you have to enable it and kind of um, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to enable it and then kind of like if you're gonna use it, uh, which is Cool, it's fine. Uh, the API still might change at this point. But you can start to build really compelling experiences. You can have a hardware, piece of hardware. This is the Play, uh, play Candle. Uh, Vincent has been walking around, uh, around the, the venue a couple of times with, with the actual play bulbs, and we've had a code lab as well where you can go and start to play with it. Um, but the idea behind it is you, know, you don't need a native application to start to interact with that experience. It literally links to a website, which then connects through to the beacon, and then you can start, or not the beacon, the, 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 the Bluetooth device, and you can start to interact with it. With it. And then you can walk away, you, know, you don't have to install it. This is a, an added to the home screen progressive web app. Like, once you've interacted with it, you don't have to install it again and use it. I think that's incredibly powerful, super lightweight experiences that we can do a lot with. Um, and it's kind of interesting, right? Like, I'm not gonna go too much into the whole Bluetooth space, but like, because like, if you're not, going to build things with Bluetooth, you probably don't have to understand it too much. But like, you have this idea of like, uh, the, the BLE beacon or the BLE device broadcasting a whole bunch of attributes. Uh, those attributes, well, you yeah, broadcast a whole bunch of attributes through the GAT, through the GAT server. Uh, you have this idea of services, like your device can have multiple kind of like super capabilities, like it could be a battery service, it could be in this case like the candle service. At that point, you connect to the service and then you can get different attributes off the back of it. So a service might have multiple attributes, like in this case, uh, the battery service, you probably only want to ever read the battery level. Um, but you can kind of get that and start to read from the data and then you can also get prompted for changes to those data. And it's actually a really simple or relatively simple API once you understand like, how to actually start interacting with the device and you know like, what data you need to send it and how you should connect to it, it's relatively simple. And it gets even simpler when you start to think about the async await syntax as well. Like you're not having to chain promises together to the next, to the next, to the next. It's actually pretty simple. But in this case, the discovery phase is you just basically call navigate.bluetooth.requestdevice, tell the type of service that you want to connect to, and then you'll get prompted to say, well, we know that there's this device here. Do you want to access it? Once you have get access, you can physically connect you get the access to the service, you call, well, you try and get access to the service. In this case, this is for a heart rate monitor. You say, I want the heart rate, uh, the heart rate service. <clears throat> and then you can say, well, I've got the service. I need to get regular data from it at that point. So I'm going to get the heart rate measurement. And in this case, I want to be notified whenever the heart rate measurement changes. And I think that's a very kind of relatively easy flow just to start getting some lightweight interactions with the device at that point. It gets a little bit more complex when you think about things like Web USB. And Web USB is it's an interesting API. And again, this is a demo from Kenneth. But the idea is that any, like, a web page could connect to a USB device. Right? So this is kind of interesting. So you send it some data through, slow typer, press send, and then it appears on the device. So you've connected to the device, and you've sent some data to it. But the interesting thing is, like, the first thing that people say is, like, I don't want a web page accessing my USB devices. And there's a very great um, like medium document by Riley Grant, who's the engineer on this project, who is basically describing the security model of web USB. And whole getting to the whole point is like not every single site or no, like, not every single site will be able to get access to any USB device. Specifically, only whitelisted sites by the device. So the device has to say, this site can access my 
like you can actually connect to the device. And then only when the user's actually opted in and granted it will the connection and connection be made. So the idea is that you can get the USB-based experiences, you can plug it in, and like the owner of the the owner of the piece of hardware will be able to say, yes, like I'm gonna build the web-based user interface for this experience. A lot of other random sites won't be able to do that. I think that's a quite a powerful security model for the web at this point. And again, the API is very similar to the to the Bluetooth API. Rather than Bluetooth.connect uh, request device, that you do the same thing but with USB. You, as the hardware vendor, know your vendor ID and all that type of stuff so you can connect to it. The user grants access, you get the call back through. And then it actually gets really complex, right? I remember a couple of years ago, uh, we tried to make an Xbox Connect uh, thing for Chrome apps, and it gets really, uh, re really complex where you have to deal with the types of control methods and the data transfer. Like, if you're into USB or hardware, you'll probably understand this. Uh, I don't particularly understand this because I'm not kind of uh, build and hardware inter interactions, but you do get to choose like the control method and the data transport me uh, mecha uh, mechanisms as well. So you get a lot of con control over the device at that point. And then we also kind of start to think about the new types of experiences. Like those two experiences, in theory, have been quite lightweight, right? You can have the device or a thing around you. You can connect to it, start experiencing with it, leave, and then that's fine, right? You've not installed a new device. The web VR experience, I think, is an interesting space to be in because it is quite. Um, I'm going to say immature is the wrong word. But it's quite nascent at the moment. Things are changing. Everyone's trying to explore what to do in the space of web VR. Like, who's got a, has anyone got a PlayStation VR? One person. Two. <coughs> I think it's pretty cool. I've, I've bought one. They're pretty cool. But like, we don't know how to use these experiences properly. We don't know how to build them properly as well. So it's a very kind of emerging market. But the Chrome team uh, in particular have been working on kind of making sure that you, know, you can start to like, build web-based experiences that are kind of are powered by like, the VR subsystem, at least anyway. And it's in. Chrome 56 at the moment. Again, it's behind an origin trial. Um, and I think the thing about web VR for me is not that it's going like, to like take over the world and everyone must kind of use it, but it's, it is uniquely positioned to be able to provide kind of compelling experiences that are very web-like. like web -like. You don't have to install a whole bunch of native applications just to experience some web-based VR content. And the interesting thing, and if you've, if you've used the Chrome Dev Summit site, is that we believe at this point, like progressive enhancement is key to this, right? That like, you can build experiences that live on the web, are there kind of, you know, for people to interact with, irrespective of whether they have like the piece of hardware that they need to experience a VR system. So that's pretty cool on that side of things. The way that we implemented it, and we're trying to think about how you implement some of these early VR experiences, like we're not saying right now that you go out and build a whole bunch of games and these the AAA class games to actually you know, take advantage of web VR, but it's a very much more incremental approach. So on the Chrome Dev Summit site, we had the play, plain old image. You got to the kind of the picture of this venue. Then you had like this 2D immersive view. So if you had like a, a device that had WebGL, you could click on it and then you could kind of like drag your mouse around and scroll around the page. Then you had this kind of AR view. If you had an iPad or an iPhone or any device with a gyroscope on, you'd be able to kind of like basically move your device around. It's not complete AR. It's like faux. Uh, AR at this point, but then if you have a headset, and if you, I think the headset got launched today, if you have the headset, you can plop your phone in and then experience the, uh, the web VR experience uh, first class. So this is the experience that we've got on the Chrome Dev Summit site. Now this is like, we know that this device doesn't have web VR, but we can provide this immersive experience because we have WebGL. And I think that's pretty cool because the, <clears throat> this is the model, right, the plain image view. The immersive 2D view, so this is where I'm kind of, I've got my phone and I can move it around. Like, not every experience is going to be like this, but it's quite powerful that you can do that. And then we've got this idea of the full immersion, right? And this is rendered using WebGL, using the WebVR viewer that Boris Muss on the Chrome team wrote, or is, is in the Google team at least now, uh, is that you can basically plop your phone in. It will know that you've connected your phone to the, uh, to the hardware, at least, and then you move around, and it automatically moves into this model. I think that's actually... It, it's actually pretty cool, right? Because you get to this point of every single user can experience your site. You're not building an application for this experience. You're not having to get people to go install it. If they have the VR kind of capabilities, they can start to take advantage of it pretty quickly. And you can do this for videos. You can do this for images. Like, a really nice way of doing it. Now, the thing I would say is, like, you can get to this point where, you know, we want to ultimately build these triple class or triple A class types of games. I personally don't know whether we're there on the web just yet. Um, but I think we're getting into a good place. And the final thing I would say is that I, <sighs> I want to get to this point where we have a common understanding, and it could be Slice, it could be any other kind of uh, model going. We have a common understanding for how we want to deploy these experiences on the web. The web has properties that no other platform has, specifically around ephemeral, ephemeral, uh, ephemerality and the ability to linkability and indexability. You can give a link to anyone. You can start to use that experience and go anywhere. 
The last thing I would say is if you are interested in, obviously, the progressive web app space uh, and the future developments from Chrome and uh, these new APIs, we do have uh, our developer portal on developers.google.com slash web. If you go to slash web slash updates, you will get all the new APIs as they come through Chrome. But our guidance and our focus is, is the new and shiny stuff is great, right? It gets people excited, and it gets you inspired to actually build the next generation things. Developers.google.com slash web is our place to build, like gives you practical guidance for all of the technologies that are available today. So much more focused on responsive design, performance, and uh, service worker and progressive web applications, and obviously developer feedback as well. So with that, I know I've run completely over time. Um, but I would like <laughs> to thank everyone. This rehearsal, right, by the way. Come on. You're still talking. Go on, yes. <laughs> so I, did, did they say keep going? Are you trying to run straight into Chrome Dev Summit 2017? Yes. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Kindlin. Go away. Not for me, you can take it up.